First of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining us in the second training um, from the AEDY conference series. Today, we are discussing restorative justice practices in schools, and we are so thrilled to welcome David Usum to present for us today. Um, David Usum has over 20 years experience as a leader and practitioner in the field of conflict resolution and restorative justice. For over 10 years, he's coordinated restorative justice movement at the Oakland Unified School District, which is considered a national model for restorative justice implementation. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we're thrilled to turn everything over to you and a long presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all. I'm coming to you from Oakland, California, where it's still dark outside. And um, in case you're wondering, I am live and direct from my daughter's bedroom. And, um, in case you see the decorations back there, because that's how we have to do things these days. But I'm really happy to be here um, to talk with you about restorative justice today, restorative justice practices in schools. And so let me just go right ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to be doing my best to monitor the chat. Um, if you have a question, there definitely is going to be a Q&A um, towards the end. Um, but I'll try and monitor the chat as we go along. Um, and feel free to use the chat to um, ask for any clarification or to uh, make a comment. I would appreciate it if you, if you did not use the chat as a way to kind of communicate with each other, um, more as a way to just um, need clarification or, or something like that. So let's just start with an opening that is this quote right here. And I'm not going to read it. I just want you to kind of read it. And you, I'm actually going to ask you to read it a couple times, maybe even three times, because it's pretty dense, but I think it's really important. Maybe read it one more time. I put this quote here as an opening um, to start right off to, to talk about language um, and also to expand our understanding of justice. Um, first of all, when, we, when it comes to restorative justice, some people will use the term restorative practices, and there might be some confusion, restorative practices or restorative justice. And um, we in Oakland, we've been using the term restorative justice long before the term restorative practices existed. And so we continue to use that term. And the reason that we continue to use the word justice is because our understanding of justice is more than just about sort of right or wrong or some sort of process. It's really about a healthy community. A just community is a healthy community. And if you, if you think about this quote, systems, institutions, and relational patterns all aligned. Think about a school and the relationships being the foundation for the systems and the patterns that happen in that school. That would be a healthy, uh, a healthy community, a just community. And so um, when I talk about restorative justice, I'm not just talking about harm or crime or wrongdoing or behavior. I'm talking about a healthy community systems being aligned in a relational way. And so um, that quote is from David Anderson Hooker. Um, so let's just review our agenda for today. We have a couple hours together. Um, I really hope this, to, to make this meaningful to you. Um, my goal is that you come out of this presentation today having a better understanding of what restorative justice is, uh, what it can look like in a school, um, and that it's worth your while. And so I just did an opening, which was the uh, quote there. I'm going to talk about the foundations of restorative justice in Oakland, the way we practice it, um, get it a little bit more into RJ and schools, talk about restorative justice as a trauma-informed practice, which it most certainly is. And then Dr. Alicia Lentz is going to share her perspective of being a practitioner of restorative justice in Pennsylvania, uh, one of your dear colleagues. Um, 
And that should say insights from implementation, not form. Every type I, every time I type the word from, it comes out as form. I have to change it. I don't know if any of you have words like that. When you type them, they always come out the wrong way. So um, I need to change that. And we'll get into some Q&A and a chance to make meaning of all, all of this uh, for you all. So that'll be our agenda for today. And... Let's just start right out with our foundational principles. These are foundational principles that we put together in Oakland that provide the basis for all the work that we do. We, um, in our meetings, our staff meetings, our RJ staff meetings, we, um, we review these um, principles. Uh, when we do trainings with teachers or students or families, we review these principles. And so I think it's really important to review them with you. Um, the first one is race matters. We do restorative justice in Oakland with a racial justice lens. And the reason we do that is because the community, you know, the, if you think about the word restorative, it means restoring to, or to put something back to its um, prior condition. In other words, if there's been a harm or a fracturing of uh, relationships in the community and you wanna restore the community to what it was, we don't wanna restore the community to something that was um, oppressive or broken or doesn't feel good. We wanna restore the community to something that, we, that is um, worth restoring to. And so in Oakland, as in most urban centers around the United States, um, African-American students are being excluded from education beyond their percentage of the population. Their, um, the the uh, exclusionary discipline is racially disproportionate. And that is the, um, the community that we're in now. And so we don't want to restore to that. We want to create the community to which we want to restore to. And so we keep that in mind as we do this work that the most of the work we do, the priority has to be on building and maintaining the community that we want. So that when something does go wrong, we need to have a difficult conversation or there's harm or a conflict that we restore to something good. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you all. We'll talk more, a little bit more about that later. Um, the second one is there's no substitute for the personal. Restorative justice is profoundly relational. The process that we use primarily, the circle process, it's like a crucible for relationships. It builds relationships, it bonds people together, it makes them feel connected to their colleagues, to their friends, um, to whoever's in that community or in that circle. And so it's a deeply relational process. It's not transactional. And a lot of school districts, uh, including our own, can be transactional at times. Um, there's not a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of what can you do for me? What can I do for you kind of relationships. And we really want to, um, um, push the relational aspect of our community rather than the transaction. The next one is nothing about us without us. This means that stakeholders in a decision, we include them in the decision. We do with people rather than to them. Okay, so um, if there's a community, a school community, instead of district leadership making a decision about that community and then notifying, notifying them, we do our best to work with the community and involve them in the decision-making process. Nothing about us without us. The next one, I'm willing to do this. We do not mandate restorative justice. We do not make people participate in restorative justice, um, whether it's just a talking circle in the classroom to, just to connect or build community, or whether it's a circle around harm or mediation um, around harm or conflict. We never um, mandate it because this is too heavy a lift, too big of a, um, a culture shift too different of a process to make people do. It doesn't really work that way. And my experience is that when people have um, been engaging in restorative justice in their school community for a while, um, a year, two years, three years or more, they understand the process and actually want to engage in it rather than resist it. Um, next, if crime hurts, hurts, justice should heal. So restorative justice is a difficult process if we're talking about harm or conflict because it involves true, real, meaningful, logically related accountability. And that accountability happens via healing, okay? So instead of punishing somebody or pushing them away from the community to, to show them that what they did was wrong, what we do is we bring them in, 
we talk about what's happened, and then they have a chance to make it right. Okay, we're going to get more into this in a little bit, but this is one of our foundational principles that justice should be healing rather than hurting. And the last one is this can work, I can live with it. We make consensual decisions in our circles. And um, at times we may intentionally decide to have a, a vote on something if we're, um, if we're coming up with ideas together and it's, they're all on a flip chart or a whiteboard or something like that, we might uh, vote on ones that um, are more realistic. But ultimately, when we make decisions in circle, they're made consensually. And, and you know, this consensus decision does not have to take a long time. It could, be, it could be a thumbs up, thumbs down, or a fist to five. There's lots of quick decision making, um, uh, quick ways to make consensus, consensus decisions. So these are our foundational principles. Um, you know, I just want to encourage you as you, um, as you look at these, just to kind of think, like, which one's resonating with you right now? As you look through here, which one is speaking to you the most? Um, and you know, for me, at different times, different ones resonate with me. Um, but these are these are something that we try to um, you know marinate in in our in our district. Something that everything we do should be based in these uh, principles. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Well, let me let me bring up the chat again. Let's see. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about restorative justice and the philosophy behind it. Some of you may know a lot about restorative justice. Some of you may just be um, new to it, coming to it for the first time right now. And so I want to encourage those of you who um, have experience in restorative justice just to have a, um, a beginner's mindset as we go through some of this introduction to restorative justice and, and pick out the new things that you might learn from it. Um, but let's just start with um, our current system of justice. And this is our criminal justice system, our school discipline systems. Um, it's what you might call retributive, right? So we pretty much ask three questions. What law or rule was broken? Who did it? And what are we going to do to them? That's pretty much how our justice system works. What law or rule is broken? Who did it? And what are we going to do to them? And typically what we do to them is um, some form of exclusion, whether it's um, uh, you know, probation or jail or prison, um, or in, in schools it might be referral out of the classroom or suspension or expulsion, um, some, some kind of um, exclusionary discipline or, or way to isolate the person from our community as a way to, to, to tell them what you did was wrong and you should, um, you should be punished or you should be, you're not allowed to be a member of our community anymore. Um, and it's retributive in the sense that um, it's about retribution. You do something and retribution is that you are now excluded from our community. In restorative justice, on the other hand, we're not so much concerned about the law that was broken or the rule that was broken. What we're concerned about is the harm that was caused. Okay, so when there's a, a crime or a harm or someone hurts another person, um, that creates uh, needs. And not only the needs of the person who's been harmed, but the needs of the person that were unmet that caused them to harm another person in the first place. You may have heard the expression, harm people, harm people, or hurt people, hurt people. That's one of the, um, the bases for this in restorative justice. It, the fact that um, restorative justice addresses the harm caused by an offense, but it also addresses the harm revealed by that offense, the original harm that caused this person to hurt another person in the first place or a group of people. So <clears throat> a harm in a community is like a tearing of the fabric of that community. Uh, and the, the goal would be then to weave that fabric back together to create that community um, and to restore that community. So um, we wanna uh, uncover the needs and then we wanna figure out whose obligation is it to meet those needs, to repair the harm, to fix it as best as possible, excuse me. <clears throat> Sometimes you just can't fix it uh, all the way. So you want to fix it as best as possible. So it's really about harms, needs, and then obligations, right? What was the harm that was caused? What are the resulting needs or the original need that caused the harm? What are the obligations to make it right? And then who needs to come together uh, in a circle or some other kind of process 
to have this conversation about what happened, what people were feeling at the time, how they feel about it now, um, what's been, you know, who's been harmed by this, <clears throat> what's been difficult, and ultimately what needs to happen to make it right. Um, that's the difference between restorative justice and punitive justice. And it is a pretty big culture shift. Um, it might be sort of easy to sort of understand intellectually by looking at these two different ways of being, but um, to actually implement this, especially in an institution, it takes commitment um, because it's a pretty heavy lift um, to move to this uh, form of being with each other um, that doesn't push people out, but, but keeps them in and, and truly holds them accountable. Um, you know, I've heard people say that, you know, our restorative justice is, uh, you know, people just, students just get away with like a hollow apology and then they're back in the classroom. I would say that's a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of restorative justice uh, when you're talking about harm. It's actually incredibly difficult to sit in a circle uh, or mediation with, uh, let's say, your grandmother, um, someone from your community that you harmed, and other people, other stakeholders, and, and truly be accountable for what you've done by listening to uh, the impact of what you've done on others, understanding the impact it had on yourself, and then seeking to make it right in a way that's oriented towards the people you've hurt. That is incredibly difficult. I've talked to many students who would be like, who are just like, you know, keep me on suspension or I'll stay on parole. I'll choose parole, uh, I'm sorry, probation over this. Um, it's just too, too difficult. And so it is very difficult to do. It is not soft. Um, it's hard to be accountable for what you've done. And again, I said, harm people, harm people, justice should heal. Um, Okay, let's see. Let me let me just bring up the chat. Let me just take a temperature check. Maybe maybe if you want to just put in the chat, like how, how are we doing right now? Are people understanding this? Are there any questions coming up for people? I just downloaded quite a bit in the first beginning here to, to provide a foundation for this. Doing good. All right, Alexis, thank you. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Any questions coming up? Any anybody need clarification? Thanks, Heidi. Doing well, everybody's doing great. All right, perfect. <laughs> Good, right on. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Good, I, I need that feedback. You know, listening is really a pretty deep form of communication as well. And um, when people are intently listening, I actually feel that, that feedback. And so this is really helpful for me to know. All right, let's move on now. So I'm going to give you a chance to just read this. This is from Harvard Magazine um, from about a month ago. Um, I, this is a screenshot from, um, I was reading it online, so I screenshot it off my phone. But um, this is the first paragraph from, a, from an article about restorative justice in Harvard Magazine. So just take a second to read this. So this, this man, Armand Coleman, was uh, in prison for 28 years. And he lived in a maximum security prison for 22 of those years, 12 of those years in solitary confinement. But then he says the time he spent in the restorative justice program there was the hardest thing he's ever done. Because when you've done something really bad um, and harmed another person, it is very difficult to come to terms with that. Um, and to do that work is incredibly difficult. I've gone into San Quentin prison. Many of you probably heard of San Quentin. It's a prison here uh, in the Bay Area. I've gone in there many times to do restorative justice, to sit in circle with the men in there who are doing this work. And um, they, um, the amount of shame that they feel uh, for having done something so bad um, is huge. And um, the fact that they are not, they, they can't reach out to the people or the family members or the people that they've hurt um, to even to say they're sorry is really hard 
for them. And they do a lot of work on understanding the impact of what they've done, not just on the families, but on everybody. Um, one, uh, once when I was there, uh, a guy was talking about um, his understanding of what led him to commit the crime he did and his understanding of the impact of it afterwards. And he put on a, on a PowerPoint, 200 people, tiny, tiny little words, 200 people's names uh, as just a beginning to understand the impact of, of, on the people that he had. And this was, um, he had committed homicide. And so it wasn't just the person that he killed or their family, it was members of the community. It was people who saw it on TV that night, people who were, um, who were impacted by it. And so that's the kind of work that he was doing, the restorative justice work. Um, and so that's why it's really difficult to come to terms with what happened to you to cause you to harm another person. And then to come to terms with the fact that you, you did harm another person. Um, and so um, this is just another example of how, um, you know, truly um, difficult it is to, to embrace a sort of justice and to, to do this work correctly. Okay, I'm going to show you a video. And this is a video of students. Now we're going to, we're going to move into schools now. Um, I've been talking a lot about the criminal justice system. Um, and now I'm going to talk about students and move into schools. And I wanna show you this video because it's our students here in Oakland. This is a high school called Fremont High School. And this is a video that was um, shot from an organization called EdSource you may have heard of. And they um, made this video and it, it really shows the RJ implementation at this school. And I'm going to invite you to, um, to watch this and think about, let me see, let me bring it up. I'm going to I'm going to send you into breakout rooms after this. I'm going to ask you to think about these questions. What is sticking with you after seeing the video? What in the video was familiar to you? And I'll put these in the chat while you watch after the video. What was new to you? What questions did it raise? And what did you resonate with as you watched this video? Okay, so here we go. So come on in everyone, take a seat. So welcome to Circle, we have a few guidelines to keep us going. So what we're doing today is a community building circle. It is a tier one practice in restorative justice. We do tier one circles to build community, to connect with each other, to practice speaking and listening in a different way. Say their name, say their name. Okay, what, what does the word say? Go ahead, What's, what does that mean to you? What I saw was missing is 100% of your community feeling part of the community. And many high schools, including this one, I've, I think there was a group of people who, who feel like they were the community and, and then everyone else was kind of left out. My name's Jordan. Um, let's go from one to 10. Jordan, what would you say your how are you feeling from zero to 10? Restorative justice, we just come to a place where we hear every person's side of the story. Before I knew about RJ, I was a tough girl, like always fighting, getting into conflict. Like I was the one always fighting, going to the office, getting reflections, getting suspended. And then now like I see where other people come from and I'd be like, okay, well, don't do this. You know, we can do this another way. In Oakland Unified, we use a three-tier system. So tier one are the practices that pretty much everybody should be doing all the time. It's relationships, that's the glue that, that holds us together. And when things break down, we do tier two. So it's a triangle. Tier two, there are fewer interventions. Ideally, there are fewer interventions. Those would be mediations, harm circles, conflict circles. And then tier three, at the top of the pyramid, 
ideally should be the fewest that we do, but that's when a student has had to be removed and we reintegrate them uh, through, through a welcome and re-entry process. And what I want to ask you is to share a time when you feel like your voice wasn't heard. Can you use your voice as a young person in Oakland? Go ahead. Um, for me personally, I feel like youth, we can't do anything about it. For example, like voting, like we didn't want Trump, but like we couldn't do anything about it because we can't vote because we're not old enough. One time, I felt like my voice wasn't being heard because I was like really little and these people had like robbed the store or whatever and I saw the whole thing but the, the people that was like doing the robbery wasn't paying attention to me because I was like a little girl. So I tried to tell the people what happened and they didn't listen to me. It's a room to just to sit in here, it's quiet, so it's like a peaceful space. Outside of school is not like that for everybody. Uh, my name is Monica and I'm feeling like a six. What restorative justice provides that traditional school discipline methods do not is the chance for people to take responsibility and understand the impact of their actions on others. It's internally driven. It has to be because I understand that there was something that I did that broke a bond here and that th this breakage is connected to other breakages that, that make all of us as a community weaker. The expectation of people to take responsibility for their actions is, is the way forward. I mean, that's the magic. That's the revolution that needs to happen. I appreciate him for being, um, being my I appreciate Spencer because he always in a good mood every day. When I did the grief circle, I needed to talk to somebody. Right. Because my mom passed away my ninth grade year when I was here. So all that weight that was on me, I told them. But at the end, I finally cried. I let everything go. And that's what the best thing was. That was the best thing that, that happened in like two, three years. We're being a good friend. We should have friends playing basketball. For it to be the space with your school, yes. that's powerful. That's powerful. Community just doesn't happen because you put people together and they're in one building. It happens because we talk, because we listen because we worry about each other, we care about each other. When they are in conflict, they need help. They don't need us to just push them out. They need us to put, bring them in. <laughs> I appreciate my for listening. There's a wider understanding from the school community that RJ can be used preventatively. It's just a cool question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you have a, a good personality and a very bright sense as a tool for community building and a tool for learning. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll see you next week. Have a good weekend. So it's not just to deal with behavior issues. It precedes that as well. It precedes it, it's after it, and it's all around it. And that's the whole point is that when we find that we have more in common with each other than not, we'll, we'll be able to get along, we'll be able to learn, uh, we'll be more peaceful and equitable with each other. All right, unmute. There we go. Um, Connor, we're going to put folks in breakouts of three, and we're going to do this for five minutes. And I'm going to copy and paste this, put it in the chat, so you have the questions. Um, let me stop my sharing. Okay, so you just saw that video of, of RJ at Fremont High School in Oakland and how we do uh, a little bit about how we do RJ in Oakland around the three tiers. Uh, so Connor, could you could you put people in breakout groups? And I'm going to ask you to um, just talk with each other, introduce yourselves to each other, talk with each other about how the impact that that video had on you and what's sticking with you. Anything familiar to you, uh, anything new? 
any questions, and what resonated with you. And then we'll see you in five minutes. Hopefully um, you all had a chance to connect with each other a little bit, talk about that video. I would love for someone else's voice to be in this space other than mine right now. If there's anyone that wants to share out something that came up for them as they watch that video, some courageous person that's willing to step out into this uh, form, I would, I would love it. Um, what stood out for you? What did you notice? What are you wondering about? What are you curious about? Just go ahead and, and share. I'll just wait until one of those people who cannot stand awkward silences will go. In our breakout room, one of the things that uh, we talked about that stood out was when the uh, faculty member said that restorative justice is, um, it proceeds and is present and is there after a behavioral issue. Mm -hmm. And it just speaks to buy-in uh, from the students. And I thought that that was really important. And I, you know, I'm just interested in knowing how do you achieve that? Yeah. You know, what level of consistency does it take? Or mm -hmm. how do you uh, pitch the idea of restorative justice to get kids to have that type of buy-in and that type of faith in the process itself? Yeah. You know, thank you so much for, for saying that and for... Um for being the first person to speak. I think that um, when it comes to restorative justice, experience really precedes belief. Um, you can talk about it, you can read about it, you can even watch these videos, but there's no way to fully understand it without participating in the process. And what I've noticed is that when students get in, get into this process, when they experience the community building circle, a talking circle, um, that they, uh, it might be weird at first, you know, people aren't waiting, aren't used to waiting for their turn. They're not used to sitting in a circle in that way, um, you know, waiting for a talking piece or waiting for everybody to speak before it's their turn. Um, once they get used to it and they flex that muscle, it really is a muscle. Once they flex that muscle of being in that space, they love it and they embrace it. And they actually have tend to have more fidelity to it than adults. In, in other words, they tend to want to go through every step of the circle, every process. Um, and so um, after a while, this, the students will demand it. Um, and so the buy-in from the students isn't really the, the issue. Um, it's about changing adult behavior that's the issue because, you know, all of us adults, we have our comfort zones. We've been in life for a while and um, we have um, things that we bring into the circle. And so... Um, I, my, ex my experience is that students, once they understand what it is and they get to experience the process for even just a few months, they, um, it's really not a problem to, to build that community with them. And they look forward to it, um, especially if you have it in a, in a, um, on a regular basis, something predictable, you know, something you know, once a week or once every couple of weeks or something, because it's a, um, then it becomes a trauma-informed practice, right? Predictability is a hallmark of a trauma-informed practice. So... Um, you may have noticed the administrator, Ms. Baez, um, also talk about community is more, more than just people in a building. You actually have to do the work to build and maintain that community on a regular basis. So um, appreciate you. Anyone else want to share out one more person? Something that came up for you that you noticed, you're wondering about? Hi, this is Kelly. In our Hi. group, we were wondering, since this was identified as a tier one support, Mm -hmm. You know, how this was implemented, how early this starts, how this is infused through the day, mm -hmm. um, you know, just curious about more, uh, learning more about it and how that could potentially be implemented. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so, yes, um, it's actually in a little bit I'm going to be talking about RJ on all three tiers of the multi-tiered system of supports. But what the, the circle um, that they were doing where they were just connecting with each other and playing a game. We play a lot of games in our circles to make it fun. Um, that was a tier one circle, a talking circle. And um, that happened. So the woman, Tatiana Chatterjee, who was featured in that video, she is an RJ facilitator. She is 1.0 FTE RJ staff at that high school. So she's doing those circles every day all day long and she's doing them herself 
She's teaching students how to do those circles so that they are then leading those circles. And she's supporting teachers in the classroom to do circles to, um, to build community in their classroom. And then she does PD, uh, professional development, with the staff. And she does circles with the staff as well. So they can create some shared values together, talk about things they need to discuss, um, and have that, <clears throat> have that process and that space to do that. <clears throat> so... Um, she also does it with community-based organizations that work with the school. Um, the City of Oakland, have, we have a violence prevention program, and she'll work with um, folks from there to come in and do circles. So um, it's kind of a, a process that's used as a way to be together, that tier one community building, that talking circle process. And it's kind of ubiquitous. It's all over, and it's happening every day, um, all the time. And... Um, because we, we use it as a way to sort of maintain our community. Um, now, you know, it's not a panacea. There, it, RJ is not going to solve all the issues of society or even all the issues that are happening in a school. Um, there are a lot of other supports needed um, in a school and the school cannot have enough supports. Can, school cannot have enough social workers as far as I'm concerned. Um, and other supports staff, and so um, teacher coaches, things like that. So, um, okay. Well, I'm glad you had a chance to check out the video. I really, I really love it. She, uh, Miss Tatiana, she's a great RJ facilitator. Um, let's move on to. I'm gonna share my slides again. To the next slide. Okay. So we talked about the three tiers. Let me just go into presentation mode again. Um, so, so all of you or some of you might be familiar with the multi-tiered system of support, the three tiers. I don't know um, how many of you understand that concept or that framework, so I'll just briefly describe it to you so we're all um, understand it. But MTSS, multi-tiered system of support, is a framework that um, people use in school settings um, to scaffold a lot, lots of different things, um, social emotional supports, positive behavior supports, um, equity, mental health supports. And the basic framework is tier one is everybody having proactive supports that, um, that create the environment where students can attend, uh, you know, and achieve and graduate basically. Um, they provide social emotional supports. Um, tier two are smaller groups of people, and tier three is individualized support. That's the basic framework. So when we're talking about scaffolding it in a restorative justice model, this is how we like to talk about it in, in Oakland, is tier one is to relate, tier two is to repair, and tier three is to restore. And what that looks like for us is relate is uh, like the circle you just saw in the video where you're connecting with your colleagues or your friends um, or other people, you're just sitting and you're talking about something, you might play a game, um, you are practicing your social and emotional skills like self-awareness, social awareness, uh, responsible decision-making, self-management, all those skills that you need to be successful in school and in life, um, you, are, you are practicing them by being in this space, by being in this circle. Um, this picture here is a circle of one of our student interns um, doing a circle at an elementary school. And you can see the, what the circle looks like. This is just a, a talking circle to, for those students to connect with each other. Um, what you're looking at here is a centerpiece, which is a cloth on the floor. We try really hard not to do circles around tables. We want to bring our whole selves to the space. And so we put a cloth on the floor. You see there's a plant there. There's talking pieces. Um, and then those pieces of paper there um, are two things. One is the guidelines that they've co-created for that circle that they will all hold each other to. They don't expect the circle keeper, the leader, the facilitator to hold everyone else to those guidelines. They all hold each other to them. And then the other uh, white pieces of paper are those student values. They are the values that those students created that they want to be present in that circle. And she was able to explain values to them in a way that differentiated in a way that they understood as elementary students. Um, one way that we describe values to elementary students is um, write down something that's important to your family or your culture or where you're from or that you hold dear. Um, and so they wrote their values. Then. And so now they, they're all sitting around this beautiful centerpiece, having this conversation about their shared values and connecting with each other and building that community. Um, and that's what a tier one circle can look like. 
um, tier two about repairing harm. So when, when most people think of restorative justice, this is what they think of. They think of repairing harm, um, dealing with conflict, and um, this is where we do those, those smaller circles um, when something happens. Um, we train students, every year we train hundreds of students across our district to be circle keepers in these kinds of circles as well as the tier one circles. Um, we have a, a robust PRRJ movement, I would call it. I won't even call it a program because it, it really is a movement in our district. And, you know, when you talk about sustainability, you know, for me as someone who coordinates the entire uh, RJ model across the entire school district, for me, I'm thinking of a sustainability. And... Um, students are in our schools for, you know, 12 years, and sometimes you, it's hard to find a, uh, an adult who's in the schools for that long. And so if you're talking about sustainability, you give this process to the students when they're young, they will expect it and, and demand it as they matriculate. And so even though the best practice with restorative justice is training adults and working with adults to help create that environment where teaching and learning can happen. If you build a robust peer RJ program, peer leadership, peer engagement around the sort of justice, that will help drive that because the adults will see that the students embrace it and, and love it and, and will um, ask for it as they move on. So, uh, and then the last tier is, is tier three, which is an individualized support, right? So this is for students. I know a lot of you um, work with students who need to re-enter after being incarcerated, re-enter school. Um, we do welcome circles to re-enter students. Um, it's not rocket science. It just makes sense to me. Like, why wouldn't you just welcome a student to your school that's been incarcerated or absent for some sustained amount of time and identify what they need to be successful and then realistically offer what you can offer to make sure that happens. Um, oftentimes students who just get put back in school and they're supposed to just um, fit right in um, after going through a, a really intense uh, process um, with all kinds of feelings associated with it and needs. And so we try to be very intentional about welcoming uh, our students upon re-entry uh, and their families, by the way. Um, and also we do, like you saw in the video, that student who lost his mother in ninth grade, that was a grief circle that was done for him. That was, circle was for him, the one person. So that was a tier three circle. That was an example of a tier three circle. It was a grief circle for him to process. And he says the best thing that's happened in the last few years to him because he was able to, to um, feel it for the first time. Um, um, and so that's, that's kind of how our, our model works. We have uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three. And then we, the way our organizational structure is, is that we have many site-based RJ facilitators in our schools. Now, if you have a school that doesn't have an RJ facilitator, other support staff can, can hold this position. You can have a case manager, you can have a um, long-term sub, it can be a teacher on special assignment, um, one of the assistant principals, if you have um, one or more of them. Um, it can be a parent volunteer. Um, it can be um, a social worker. Um, so there's, there's lots of um, people that can hold this work. They need to be obviously trained in it, provide coaching. Um, but um, it really helps to have <clears throat> a person at the school whose job it is, is to support the entire school community in embracing restorative justice. And so what we're trying to do is deprofessionalize that role. In other words, they're there not to do restorative justice for the school. They are there to support everyone else in embracing restorative justice and provide the coaching and the expertise for people to do that. Okay, so it's kind of different than, than other roles in a school um, where you might go, you know, if you have a math question, you go to the math teacher. If you have, um, if you need therapy, you would go to the counselor or the, or the social worker. Um, in restorative justice, we train everyone in restorative justice and, and ask them to do it with coaching from that person. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, it's a different model. And again, it's, it takes time to embrace this and to do this um, in a school. So um, this is our three-tiered model and let's move on. So now I want to show you, this is a video, we just shot this on a phone uh, in one of our middle schools. I wanted to give you a, um, a glimpse into a teacher getting her students into circle in her classroom. And um, as you're watching this video, I want you to think about what is the teacher doing? 
as she gets her students in a circle. And then what are the students doing? And I am going to ask you afterwards to share either in the chat or out loud to unmute and tell me what, what you notice the students doing, what you notice the teacher doing, and what do you notice the, um, the room? What do you notice in the room? Okay, so it's, it's a quick video. For the purposes of community circle, what does a circle need to look like for community circle? circle. Daniel. Circle. Does it need to be perfectly round? No. no. Okay, so what is it, what does need to be true? Uh, there's no desks in the middle. There's no desks in the middle. Okay, Osmara? Everybody has to be included. Everybody has, you have to, yep, everyone has to be included in the circle as part of the circle. Can't have people hanging out in the back. Yep, uh, Catherine. You can see everybody's face. You can see everybody's face. You need to be able to see everybody's face as you look around the circle. Anything else? Anyone to think of anything else that's true to the circle? Vanessa, did you have something to share about what a circle? Yeah, come on. Only talk when we show trying to talk. Okay, yeah, and that's once we start the circle. Right? So we're kind of just talking about what it looks like. So it doesn't need to be perfectly round, but there shouldn't be space in between the desks either. We want to be as tight of a circle as we can. Okay, so on your marks, get set, go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me um, bring it back to that point. I was trying For to the purposes of community circle. Vanessa, did you have something? It doesn't need to be perfectly round. But there On your marks. Get set. Go. <laughs> So, let's see, what did you notice the teacher doing in that video? Let me hear from some folks. Talk to me. What did you see the teacher do? I think she allowed the students to choose, you know, to describe how the circle should look and just kind of reinforce that they knew what was expected of the circle. Like, we, everybody has to have their face, everybody has to see their face. They wanted to tighten it up, but she made, she questioned the students to allow them to facilitate how the circle should look. Yes, thank you, David. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She asked them, what does circle look like? And as people are saying in the chat, they, um, they told her. And she made sure that they understood what it looked like to get in the circle. Um, and they, they were able to tell her what a circle should look, should look like. And then, um, and then, so what did you notice the students doing in that video? Go ahead, somebody. Share out. What did you see the students do? I saw them wanting to be a part of and, you know, jumping right in, basically. Yeah, they jumped right in. Um, yeah. They helped each other, right? And I, I really particularly liked the play aspect of it when it was like, re ready, set, go. It, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. And, and Doug, one of the reasons why they um, got in circle so fast is because they do play a game when they're in circle too. They also talk about things they need to discuss, but um, 
but they played a game too. And so those students were just like, yes, we are going to get in circle as fast as possible. We're going to help each other get in circle. We're going to move these desks. We're going to make sure there's no empty desks between us. We're going to make sure we see everybody's face. And we're going to do that quick because we want time to play this game and to talk with each other. Um, a couple things uh, that you may have noticed. So from the time she said, ready, set, go, to the time she rang that bell was exactly 60 seconds. And that was 37 students all in those desks. Um, so it's totally doable um, to get students in circle. Um, and that's an example. I think that video was shot in, uh, in the springtime. So the students have had plenty of experience getting in circle and being in circle. So that's an example of students understanding the process, liking it, and wanting to do it and making it happen. Um, the other thing about that class is that she uh, used instructional time to do circles. She did not use advisory or some other time. She understood that spending time doing this and building community and creating the environment for teaching and learning actually saved time in the long run. So she did circle every Friday morning during instructional time in, um, and the students could depend on that. They, they knew that that circle is going to happen and that creates safety. That feels safe if I know every Friday morning we're going to be we're going to be doing this thing. Like I said earlier, predictability is a hallmark of a trauma informed practice. If people can predict, they know what's going to happen. It feels safe. So, regular circles on a regular basis. That's that's what she did. The other thing you may um, have noticed is that there were paper plates. Here, let me let me show you. There's paper plates all along the top part of the wall. Let's see if you can see it here. And so all these all these paper plates are kind of hard to see. Um, those are all the students' values, and they're on all four walls because you know lots of students cycle through this um, class, right? So those values were created in circle. They came in, they sat in a circle, they each got a paper plate and some markers, and they wrote the values that they wanted to see present in this space on these paper plates, went around, shared their values, put them in the center, center of the circle, and then she put them up. And uh, now when those students walk in to that classroom, they see their, what's their values, what's important to them, what they hold dear, present in that space. And that's important because it creates a shared space, not just this is the teacher's classroom, this is our space where my values are represented. And that's really important. And so you can see those values in those paper plates, um, you know, and values that students write, you know, a big one is respect, right? Honesty, open-mindedness, non-judgment, love, trust, um, those kinds of things. Basic human values that no matter where you go in the world, you're going to find present. Just by being human, we tend to have the same values when you do a values exercise, whether it's here or whether it's in Rwanda or whether it's in Australia, you're going to get um, people saying the same values. So it's just by nature of being human. Okay. Um, anyone else have anything they want to um, say about that video or what they noticed about it before we move on? One thing I noticed too is I like the students, that whole idea of the community. I mean, when they said that, man, everybody got on page. And like you said, it's been trained, but it shows that the RJ concept of that community, they they fed into that 100%. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you alluded to how long, I mean, how quick did they jump right into it, but they you saw the kids helping each other. You saw that everybody was working together as a unit, almost as a team. And they just brought into that idea of that's their community. and. Yeah, it was refreshing to look at, you know. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right, let's let's move right along and go to this next slide. Now, this is this is a slide I want to share this with you. I'm not going to put it in presentation mode. I hope you don't mind. I just you know, it's like sometimes it's just easier just to look at it this way. If you can't see it, let me know um, and I can go into presentation mode. Um, so just you can just put it in the chat like, hey, David, go into presentation mode. This is too small. I can't see it. Um, but if not, we'll look at it like this. Um, this is what's called the range of the response, or sometimes we call it the um, um, how to be with each other. And so I know it's a, it's a lot of colors and words here, but I'm going to explain it to you. You'll understand it in a second. Um, it's really a graph. 
And um, this is I pulled this from the New Zealand Ministry of Education, their Kete manual. A Kete is a Maori or Aboriginal word for a communal basket. And um, New Zealand is um, where sort of the modern um, restorative justice came from because the Maori, it's a Maori, um, in New Zealand, in New Zealand, it was a Maori concept and they convinced their government to embrace their practices uh, when it comes to um, criminal justice, especially juvenile justice, but also in schools. And they've put together these um, Kete manuals. If you want to Google it, it's called Positive Behavior for Learning or PB4, the number 4L, PB4L. Um, and you can look on their webpage, and there's on the right hand side, it'll say Kete manuals. And they're, they're really great. They're, they're really helpful. And this um, came from there. And then I, um, I amended it. I added the words culture and climate and um, I think some of the other words in the, the line. So there's an x-axis and a y-axis uh, in this graph. And um, the x-axis, which I believe is up or down um, one, is about creating systems, creating expectations for ways of being with each other. You might call them positive rituals and traditions that you have in your classroom, ways to do things. And that's the culture. Right, the culture, those rituals and those traditions you have in your classroom. It could be as simple as you know meeting the students at the door, giving them a handshake or a high five as they walk in, or it could be you know how to raise your hand to do something, or how to get into a small group and how to get out of a small group. You know, just the way we do things in our classroom um, that are taught, consistent, and maintained. Now the y-axis on the horizontal, that's about how it feels, right? In being in relationship with. Um, and so the more in relationship with, the higher you would be, you know, the more connected you are as a community and to with people. So let's just start with the restorative one. That would be characterized as being in high relationship with, supportive, as well as having systems and knowing how things are done, positive rituals and traditions. That would be characterized as being with people. You're working with students. Um, as opposed to at the top left, you can see if all you have is rules, the, the x-axis, if all you have is rules and ways to do things, but there's no relational component there, the climate, how it feels, then that will be considered doing too. There's no, the student has no agency in what's happening. You are just doing to them because there's no relational content. It's just all rules. And on the bottom right, if you have nothing but um, a supportive environment, nothing but relationship with, then you're actually operating from a deficit framework where you, where you think you're operating as if the student needs you to do things for them, make excuses for them because there's no systems in place and it's just relational. And then that's really supportive in the short run, but ultimately it's not helpful at all. And then um, if you have no systems in place, no expectations, no ways of doing things, no positive rituals or traditions, and there's no relational content, that would be um, characterized as neglectful, right? Um, for example, if you're on the courtyard or the playground and you see a fight brewing between two students, and you just are like, okay, I'm not seeing that right now, and you walk the other way, right? That would be an example of, of not being in relationship with, not um, following any of the expectations in place, being neglectful, right? So um, the idea is to be as restorative as possible, which means connecting with students and your and fellow colleagues and staff, being um, in relationship with them, having spaces to build those relationships, but also having systems in place for how to do things, expectations, um, um, positive rituals and traditions that are that are predictable. There's that word again in the classroom, right? Um, and uh, because you know, some people might say, "Well, restorative justice, you know, it's all about just you know being in relationship with and being friends with the students." And that's 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 wrong, actually. That's a misunderstanding. Um, yeah, it's highly relational, deeply relational, but it's not without having systems and expectations. Um, in fact, it depends on them. It depends on everyone understanding what they are, co-creating them in an inclusive way so that people have buy-in. And then you're working with people. You're including the stakeholders, in this case students, in the processes that are at play in, in the community. 
So um, hopefully this makes sense. So are there any questions about this? It, it really helps explain um, what, what it can look like in the classroom or in the school. You're working with each other rather than doing two or doing four or not doing. If you have any questions, go ahead, throw them in the chat. I have it up. So. Okay, I'm going to, um, what I'm going to do now is move into the next slide, which I'm going to present for in presentation mode. So I've talked a lot about trauma and the impact of trauma uh, and restorative justice as a response or a proactive way to mitigate that. Um, I want to talk uh, specifically about it right now. So a traumatic event or traumatic events over time cause a cycle, a, a vicious cycle of harm and aggression and trauma and harm and aggression. And um, many students in Oakland um, experience acute trauma, meaning, meaning at least one traumatic event or more likely complex trauma, which would be traumatic events over time, multiple traumatic events. And it causes a cycle of harm and aggression. So trauma can cause aggression, which can cause harm. Remember when I said harmed people harm people? This is what I mean. People who've been harmed that have, are um, not able to deal with that harm effectively will revisit that harm on others. And so, for example, in the classroom, if a student is, you know, quote, misbehaving, it's up to us as the adults to think like, is this a coping mechanism for something that they've experienced outside of my classroom? Were they triggered by something, a sight, a sound, a smell, uh, a movement, anything? And is this um, a function? Uh, is this behavior a function of something else? Okay, because if you're just disciplining for that behavior, you're missing the boat entirely. You're, you're just um, dealing with a surface thing and you're not dealing with the root of what's really happening for that student. Okay, this is understanding trauma and how it impacts students. And so when students, many students come into our classroom and teachers too, adults as well, they might bite, might be in fight, flight, or freeze mode because experiencing a traumatic event acutely or complex over time can put you into that mode of fight flight or freeze. And I can tell you there's one thing that is not going to happen when you come to school in that mode, and that's learning. Uh, it's impossible to learn if you are in that survival mode of fight, flight, or freeze. Okay. Um, so what then has to come from that? We need to create a space where, where people, students and adults, can break out of that fight, flight, or freeze mode, that cycle of harm and aggression that trauma can cause. How do you do that? Number one, safety. They need to feel safe. Um, we need to feel safe. We need to create an environment in the classroom that even if it's the only safe place they have, it's incumbent upon us to, to help create it and they need to help create it with us. And so it may seem like circles in the classroom to connect and to talk about things are, you know, kind of a fun thing to do if you have time. It's actually, it's actually much deeper than that. This is what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about creating a, a, a place where students feel like they can be, um, where they can learn, where they can be vulnerable, where they can practice social and emotional support, um, social emotional skills. Okay, again, social and emotional skills are what we need to be successful, not only in school, but in life, just to be in relationship with people, whether it's a, in a business relationship or a loving relationship. We need social and emotional supports. And we need social and emotional supports to access the executive functioning part of our brain, that, that frontal cortex here. That is what we use to organize, to plan, to do homework, to figure out what to do when, to um, read a text and then argue persuasively a point of view based on evidence cited from that text. None of that's going to happen if you're stuck in flight, fight, or freeze mode. In fact, students, they should be given a medal just for showing up when they're in that mode, okay? So it's incumbent upon us as educators, as people who build a community of learners, 
to create the environment where learning can happen, which means not just delivering curriculum, but actually creating that environment where students can break free of that cycle of harm and aggression, where they can feel connected to their classmates so that they can access the part of their brain that allows them to engage in learning, that allows them to connect with the text or, or do that math problem or understand um, biology or science, right? So this is how restorative justice fits into that trauma-informed perspective. Um, it's important to understand this because um, this, is the, this is another reason why those tier one circles are so important. You know, 90% of the work we do in Oakland isn't around harm or conflict. It's around these kinds of circles to create the community that which we want to restore to when we need to, when we need to do that, okay? Uh, any questions popping up for folks? Anything, um, anybody wanna um, say about this? Anybody need clarification? Go ahead and put it in the chat or share out loud. Okay. All right, so then I'm going to drum roll, please, pass the um, mic to Dr. Alicia Lance. So uh, some of you might know her. She's director of alternative ed in Allegheny Intermediate Unit. Um, let's see, um, Dr. Leisha, you have the floor. You can talk about your perspective being a practitioner in Pennsylvania of restorative justice. And um, let's see, what time is it? Eight thirteen. I don't know. You, maybe about um, you, five minutes or so. Um, we can see how it goes. Um, how much time you need. So. Um, you can go ahead and unmute and talk. Thanks, Dave. Can you stop sharing so I could see people? Because then I'm just talking to little, I'd rather talk to little squares. Yes. And I think it's hilarious. And those of you that know me, that David had to put a time constraint on me. So, <laughs> which is totally fine and I'm not offended by it. But um, no, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about, you know, my experience with restorative practices in the in the role that I do now. Um, at the AIU, you know, doing alt-ed under AEDY, but also doing education for incarcerated youth. Um, but also the work that I did in my, in my previous life, and I have some colleagues on the call from the Woodland Hill School District, when I was really introduced to David and his team um, in Oakland and, and how we, we did this. So I'll briefly do like a, a two-prong approach about what it would look like in a school district, which many of you are are, are associated with, then also what it looks like in alt ed, um, and more specifically in um, juvenile justice as it relates to tier two, but that tier three model that we're really working to do um, at the AIU. So, um, and, and I just wanna say that, you know, this isn't a program that you can purchase. Um, this is a mindset. This is changing the hearts and minds of teachers, administrators, um, school boards, community, and the kids, although we know that it's easier to change the minds of the kids because this is natural for them, right? Like we do circle time in kindergarten, right? And, and we can do it as seniors. It just takes, um, you know, a level of implementation and, and, and a level of desire from, from the, the teachers and the staff to do this. So um, it's really about changing your mindset and, and David and his team are amazing. I was privileged to, to go out there oh geez, it's almost been four years, um, to Oakland with a colleague of mine to, to really sit and, and do their training. And then David has uh, done more trainings for us when I was still with Woodland Hills and he's done trainings for me at the AIU. Um, and I became affiliated with them through the University of Pittsburgh, a uh, school of social work with a just discipline project uh, with Dr. Jay Hughley. So I always have to give a shout out to Pitt because they really connected us to Oakland uh, when we were really looking at policy level changes with our code of conduct. And so when we implemented this um, in a school district, it, it really was Pitt approaching us and, and we initially did it in a four, five, six building. Um, and I know that, that Don Golden and, and Marlene Youngblood are on the call from Woodland Hills and, and they were you know, instrumental in, in making sure that we were doing this, right? And we were doing it correctly. Um, we had student leadership teams 
um, and they really led the way. The teachers bought into it, um, but it takes time. It it takes time and it takes conviction um, from the leaders and from the from the kids, right? And and from the community. And so, you know, David talked heavily on the on the community building piece, which anybody can do. You don't need that embedded in policy, right? You don't have to change your code of conduct to be restorative. Um, you just have to change the mindsets of the teachers and make sure that they they do it. Um, you, there's plenty of resources. There's a lot of training out there. Um, you know, a lot of books to really formulate this. There's frameworks. There's all types of things that you can do to really implement this in your classroom. Um, and, and you can do it once a week. You can do it once a day. I know that um, teachers came to me and were like, kids were like, we're circling up because they noticed a, a conflict in their room and they wanted to have community. So in terms of a, an implementation into a school district, um, it's easy in my opinion, but it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of conviction. And you do have to point out those, those kiddos that are gonna be your leaders, right? And, and understand what a, what a student leader is. It's not always the kids that self-identify as a leader, right? But it's the kids that really have those, those leadership qualities. Um, and I'm gonna to pivot to the all ed space. You know, you know, we have kiddos in, in our AADY programs that you know, we're transitioning back to their school districts. And so, you know, we're really looking at the, that tier three intervention of what that reintegration, what that welcoming looks like, right? What does the kid need? It's not about what, you know, they, they did their time, right? Fine. Like, but like what David had said, you know, you did your time for your crime, um, which is so harsh and, and, and how we think, but that's just where we're at, right? Um, but what we really did is so through Pitt, I piloted with four school districts in Allegheny County, um, Woodland Hills was one and, and a few other school districts. And we really kind of brought this training to those schools in the anticipation of when we got kids back, because, you know, we, we do have um, our kiddos back uh, in the buildings and now they're working to transition back to the schools. And so for me, it's really, you know, spreading this knowledge to other school districts. And when kiddos are coming back from an alternative placement, when kiddos are coming back from detention, when kiddos are coming back from um, even a, a, a long placement, when they're coming back from a suspension, right? When they're truant and they're coming back to school because they haven't been there for a long time, or whether they're a new student to your building, you can have a welcoming circle where, you know, and there's, there's frameworks involved, but where you really sit down and, and like David said, it's tailored to the needs of the kid. And you don't want to say, what did you do and harp on that? We know what they did. You sent them out of your school district somewhere else or their behaviors got them sent somewhere else. So what you wanna do is welcome them back, look at all the skills and abilities that you uncovered as a placement facility, right? Whether it's a school or whatever, and then share that. Like, what does the kid like? And it becomes a communal thing and everybody's level. You have to take the authoritarian work out of it when you're in those circles. Because, and like David said, like you want to sit, you don't want to be at tables or whatever if you can. I mean, sometimes in a classroom, the kiddos have to be at a desk, but you really want to be sitting and your whole self is in there. So the kids know that they're on an equal playing field. So um, I, you know, was introduced to restorative practices probably a decade ago. Um, and, and worked really hard with, with a lot of great people to really infuse it into um, a code of conduct, to really infuse it into policy. And now I'm, I'm, I'm taking, you know, all of those, those skills and abilities and, and, and really reflecting on what we did um, and always being tied to David and his team because, and go on Oakland's website, they are the Mecca of restorative. And their mindset is one that I think if you're excited a little bit right now, that's how they are 24 seven. I was just on a training with David and his team the last two days um, and it was a refresh and, and I had known a lot of the content, but it was good to, to be in a space with like-minded people. And so really when we're, we're reintegrating these kiddos back and those of you in Allegheny County, and I know a lot of my teachers from, from Community School East are on the call, and I, and I appreciate you, um, but we're really trying to change the mindset of people. We're really trying to give kids that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth chance that they deserve, right? Because it's their right. Um, and, and we can't keep excluding them from school. Um, there is a time and a place for that, but we really have to dig down deep. So I love the piece about, you know, wrapping the trauma in with that. 
and, and really understanding our kids and our families and communities. Um, and and the, the last thing I'll say is a critical piece is the family, is that family and community engagement. And we know that family is defined differently now and, and, and it might not be a mom and a dad, it, it might be an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a relative, a foster parent, but then also community members involved. So if, if this is something that you're trying to do in your community, I would implore you to, when you're doing trainings, when you figure that out, get community members involved. Your stakeholders are outside of your school community. It's, it's the community as a whole and, and really get them involved to do the work. And so when kids and families are in the community, the community understands what you as a school district or you as an organization are doing. And, and, and they can kind of help you build that street cred, right? So I can go on and on. I'm gonna put my information in the chat if anybody wants to talk through this because I, I, I do sit in an intermediate unit system. And so I, I can connect with, with those of you across the state to really talk more of, of what we did, not only when I was in a school district, but what we're doing at, at the IU with alternative ed and, and partnerships with, with people like Oakland and um, the University of Pittsburgh. So thanks for your time. I went over, Dave, I'm sorry, you could have cut me off. No, it's all good. Thank you, that was great. Really um, um, concise, great. So anybody have any questions for, for Alicia while we're here and while she's here, she's doing the work in your neck of the woods. Anything coming up for you based on anything she said or questions popping up? that she could answer right here, right now. Well, I encourage you to reach out to her then. Um, she even put her cell number there. Um, so um, reach out to her because she's she's got a lot of knowledge um, and she's, she's deep into this. And so thank you, uh, Alicia. Thanks so much for, for doing that. That's helpful understand where you're at um all right are we ready to move on yeah can i get a couple head nods yes all right good thank you let's move on then okay all right um let's talk about um just some examples um of what rj can look like in school there's obviously a lot more than this and it's going to differ based on each school community. Um, we really design RJ um, uh, for each school. Each school is its own you know, unique ecosystem. Uh, and so we, we work with each school. Um, but these are just some examples of what it can look like in a school, um, what you might see when you're um, at a school implementing RJ. Um, you're gonna see regular talking circles, community building circles, um, with everybody, not just students, um, but with members of the community, community-based organizations, um, with staff, parents, um, to, to be proactive. Um, you're going to see people working with each other to collectively create um, how they want to be together um, with guidelines or norms. Um, a restorative conversation is a conversation, many of you may have seen this kind of particular flow, but you know, the first question is what happened? It's not why did you do that or what's wrong with you or what the hell were you thinking? The first question is what happened? Um, and we invite people to tell the story of what happened. Now, sometimes when, when people have um, uh, been felt that they've been victimized, they need to express that first before they're willing to be accountability, accountable. And so um, remember, harmed people harm people. And so we want, we want to make sure and listen to that first. Um, if someone feels like um, they need, they're not quite being accountable because they're blaming what they did on someone else. Like, well, she made me do it, or I only did it because they were, you know, picking on me or whatever. Um, we need to allow them to express that before they're able to tell their story and be accountable. Um, but the first question is what happened? Um, and sometimes I'll say, what happened and start from whenever you like. And you'd be surprised how many students start from like five years ago in elementary school or last year my brother died or, you know, they, they understand um, what may have caused them to kind of be upset and cause harm. Um, you know, the fact is like in English and in math, when people make, an, make a mistake, we give them chances to correct the mistake, right? Like you misspelled that word, why don't you... Um, figure out how to spell it and, and re-spell it. Or you made a mistake in that math problem, here's what here's how you made it, why don't you redo the problem? And we give people a chance, but when it comes to behavior, we often don't do that for some reason. 
Um, and so it would make sense that we would give people a chance to correct um, or make it right if they um, are behaving in a particular way. Um, so we, we move through, a, our sort of conversation moves through what happened, what were you thinking at the time and feeling at the time, uh, how do you feel about it now, um, what's been difficult for you, who's been impacted by this, uh, and ultimately what can be done to make it better, to make it right. Um, you might see circles or mediations around harm or conflict, and of, oftentimes some of these are student-led, student-facilitated, um, to really get to the root of what, what's going on and to repair those relationships and problem-solve those conflicts. Um, we also, like I said, we have a robust student leadership model where we train students in this, this process and um, they engage in RJ with, with other students, with their classmates, with their staff. We even have students who train teachers in restorative justice at their school sites. Um, we also have a district um, student governing body called the All City Council and they embrace restorative justice as a way of uh, being together in community and resolving conflict and making decisions as well. Um, Leisha talked about welcome circles for reentry. Um, we also do we also do um, circles for like um, adults. Like for example, if in the middle of the year a teacher has to leave because let's say she's going on maternity leave, you might do a circle for that student. I mean that teacher as she transitions out, and you the students might do a circle for the new uh, teacher coming in. This is how we do things in our classroom. These are our expectations. These are our um, ways of being together. Um, what do you like? You know that kind of thing. And, and it just again. This is all just stuff that kind of makes sense to me. Why wouldn't you just welcome somebody new uh, into your community and transition people out that need to leave and to do that with care? Um, um, again, more you're going to see more relationships, more relational um, um, ways of being together rather than transactional. And then discipline is going to be a learning process rather than a punishment process. If you think about the word discipline and disciple, you know, the root disciple as someone who's learning, that's, that's what discipline should be. It should be a learning process. It shouldn't be a process to just get somebody mad at you for pushing them out of school. It should be a process where people understand the impact of what they've done and then seek to make it right. Um, so I'm looking at the chat and I see uh, Bill talking about what is your thinking about applying moral principles to solutions? What is the right thing to do? Um, we, we're not going to apply moral principles about what the right thing to do is because we collectively, if we're deciding how, what, we want, what needs to happen in order to make something right, um, it's not about um, what's right, sort of this objective what is right. Um, it's about based on the needs of the people, their expressed needs in that circle. So it's, vic it's oriented to the people who've been harmed, if this is a harm circle, um, which includes the person who had done the harm. Um, and we, under we figure out what those needs are. This is only after extensive prep work do we even bring people together. We figure out what their needs are. And so what is right is just based on what um, their needs are and the best way to reweave the, those relationships back together or that, that community back together. So it's not about applying a, a sort, of, sort of objective moral uh, principle. It's about um, um, listening to and, and uncovering needs and then meeting those needs, uh, those unmet needs. Um, how do I deal with students who are not ready to, quote, buy into the RJ process? Um, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't ready to, to buy in, uh, adults included, um, yeah, or staff buy-in, exactly. Um, it, like I said earlier, it, experience precedes belief. And here's how I work with a school. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't make anybody do this. It's too heavy of a lift to, to make them do it, right? Um, what I do is um, I work with the early adopters. I work with the staff who are like, you know, we'll do a workshop or orientation or a training. And there's always going to be a good chunk of staff or teachers that want to do this and they want help doing it. And I work with them. And you know what's interesting is they tend to be the teacher leaders um, because they don't see this as another thing they have to do. They see it as a best practice. So many of them, I can't tell you how many times I've heard a teacher say, oh, I do this already. I just didn't you know, do it exactly like this or I didn't use a talking piece or whatever or I never had words for it. You know, I never called it anything. It's just, it's just makes sense that you would build community um, and then use that as the foundation for you know, dealing with conflict or harm. And so um, 
then we leverage their relationships with the other teachers and the other staff and the parents to um, get people into circle, to get people to experience the process. Um, it does take a leader, a principal that is um, that uh, understands what it is and wants to support it and encourages it and see, wants to see it happening and says we are a restorative justice school and takes the time to be in those processes as well. Um, doesn't mean they're the ones that have to do all the RJ processes, but they have to want to see it happen and, and message that to the school community. Um, leadership is key. Principal leadership is key for this. Um, and it's a slow process. It's not something that takes um, even a, a year. It takes multiple years um, to really embrace this because it's too easy to just shift back to what we know, which is this, the current paradigm, um, which we know doesn't work. Um, it's been proven time and time and time and time again that the current paradigm of the um, way schooling is done has not worked, especially for African-American students, where if you look at the exclusionary discipline, um, their civil rights are being violated by it being excluded from education beyond their percentage of the population in uh, many school districts. So that uh, is a moral imperative to do better. And so... Um, so we do it slowly, and we, um, and we get buy-in by people experiencing the process. Um, student buy-in, um, my experience with students is that some are, they, they're a little, just like adults, they might giggle at first, they might do side conversations, but once they, once they see what it is and they have conversations that actually they want to have, it's not, not necessarily the adult talking about, you know, coming up with the um, questions. You know, some uh, a good teacher will survey the students, like, what kind of questions do you want to talk about? What kind of things do you want to talk about? And that's what the circle is about. Or, or you might play games that um, that are fun to do, but also have the serve the purpose of connecting and, and so forth. So, um, I haven't seen really a problem with student buy-in. In, in Oakland, students um, students are demanding restorative justice. Um, they they're the ones that are embracing it um, in a way that has created a movement across our district. Um, a couple years back, our budget was being threatened because uh, we're in we're in a uh, dire budget crisis in Oakland, and the students would had rallies, press conferences, stood up in front of the board. I saw students that needed a chair to stand up in front of the. Uh, podium because they were so small they were like you know eight nine years old talking to the in, to the school board saying that they don't want restorative justice to be cut and so um so the students have been the issue the, um they they embrace it i uh, haven't seen uh, adults do that as as much as students can so um but yeah staff buy-in is about once people see that it's not scary that um they can they can um that it feels good to be connected to their colleagues, um, that it builds morale, that it clarifies things that might not, um, that might need clarification. And it's a way to um, like deal with issues. Like there is a lot of adult conflict in Oakland. I'm sure there is in uh, Pennsylvania too, um, but there's a lot of adult conflict and um, you can't just sweep it under the rug because conflict will manifest. It'll find a way. It's gonna be like whack-a-mole, it will pop up. And so, um, it's it's better to effectively deal with it, and this is a process that we can can do that. Um, all right, so now um, let's see what time we got. Eight thirty-four. Okay. Um, what I want to do now is I want to um, give you my ten insights from implementing restorative justice uh, at Oakland Unified for the last um, going on eleven years now. But I've been doing restorative justice longer than I've been at Oakland Unified. For about five years before I got to Oakland, I was acting as a thought partner with Oakland Unified um, as they began the RJ implementation there. Um, so really I've been working with the school district for about 16 years doing restorative justice. Five as a, um, a community partner. I was working at a nonprofit doing conflict resolution. Um, and embracing RJ there. So, so I'm going to give you some insights um, one by one um, based on my experience doing this work. The first one is, like I said earlier, race matters. It, it's really absolutely crucial to do this, to do restorative justice with a racial justice lens if we want to make real change. Um, Restorative justice is, uh, like I keep saying, it's a heavy lift. It's about changing how we are with each other, and it's about changing our community to the one that's inclusive of everybody and reckoning with things that need to be reckoned with uh, and providing healing and reconciliation. And so 
I think you're missing the boat if you don't have a racial justice lens while you're doing this work. Um, you know, you, you want to create the community that you can restore to and feel good about that. Um, and we don't want to restore to something that's oppressive to a percentage of our population. We just don't want to do that. Um, so we need to transform our community. Race matters when doing restorative justice. The other thing to understand about restorative justice is that there is no single origin to this that you can point to for where this came from. Um, it is based on ancestral practices, not one particular group of people, not the Maori in New Zealand necessarily, not the, uh, D the Navajo here, not... Um, Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa. It's a process that many of our ancestors practice, our indigenous communities practice, and that is being in community with each other in an inclusive way. Um, and many um, indigenous communities, not all, will um, respond to harm in that way, right? <clears throat> in um, in Canada, the, Canada, the Nishka Nation, they don't have a word for offender in their language. Um, the, the word for offender in their language, as close as you can get, is unhealed. Someone who is unhealed. Okay? So that kind of um, idea and thinking is what I mean when I talk about it. it comes from indigenous or ancestral origins. Um, the next thing is that um, it's good to come up. So we have our foundational principles. It's the very first thing I went over with you all, if you can remember them. The first one was race matters. The last one was um, this can work, I can live with it. Um, and I would encourage you to, to do that work of coming up with your foundational principles, like your values, what are you operating from, and, and hold to them and remind yourself of them. Because um, um, it really takes reminding ourselves of this to, um, to do this in an institution um, like public education in the United States, which has been around a very long time and has a very specific way of doing things. And so... Uh, it takes constant vigilance to really do this right. And so we have our foundational principles. We stick to them um, and revisit them. And I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, the fourth is to um, build and support a youth movement. Um, in high school, you can incorporate restorative justice into the pathways of the different academies. Um, you can incorporate it into your student student governing body um, by by. Um, supporting them in doing circle with each other um, to be proactive and also to make decisions uh, together and also to um, uh, deal with harm or conflict as it arises. Um, in terms of the high school pathways, a couple examples. Um, here in Oakland, we have Oakland High, we have the law and social justice pathway, um, which has incorporated restorative justice as an industry standard into their pathway. Uh, at Skyline High School, the community and education pathway has incorporated restorative justice as a model for uh, an industry standard of um, uh, in that pathway. Uh, and other high schools, too, have incorporated it um, into their pathways. Um, middle schools, there is, a, there is a, a lot of peer restorative justice happening in middle schools, probably more than any of our other schools, but also elementary and high school. Um, but I think it's really important like I said, while the best practice is to, to change adult behavior, um, it's really important to allow students to embrace this in a way that they, um, that it's theirs, that is theirs. Once, once you train them in it, they will, they will run with it. Um, here's a word I developed. I don't think this is an actual word, curriculumization, but my point here is that um, I've been asked to come up with an RJ curriculum um, I think they stopped asking because I purposely have never come up with a curriculum. We have all kinds of materials, all kinds of tools that we developed. Um, we have um, an implementation, couple implementation guides, which are navigational tools for people as they're doing this work. But the second you develop a curriculum, which is like a step-by-step, -step, do this, then this, then watch this video and do this, um, it's just something people can put on the shelf. If I ever handed a principal or a teacher a three-ring binder and said, here, just start on page one and end, you know, at the end of the year, you'll be on page, you know, 100 or whatever, um, they would just put it on the shelf. And that's why people get initiative fatigue. And that's why they get flavor of the month fatigue, because things come and go in school districts. Things get hot and then they go away. Um, we have purposely never developed a curriculum. 
we're embracing a way of life, a way of being with each other, a way of doing things. And we train people on the philosophy and the set of practices, and then we coach them nonstop. And that's why RJ has been around it in Oakland Unified School District for so long, because it's never been a physical thing that you can just put on the shelf and say, okay, um, sure, I'll get to that when I get to it. Or what's the next thing? Um, and so that's what I say, that's what I mean when I say resist curriculumization. Um, um, you know, everything else in uh, education, um, there's a curriculum for and, and this is just different. This is, this is more of a philosophy that we're asking people to embrace, which is why it takes a commitment to do this. Um, it really does. The other thing that I um, sort of learned um, the hard way, really, was um, in the beginning, I used to think that if I, create, if I help a school create a system that's restorative in place, um, that it was non-personality dependent, like here's how we do things in this school, that no matter who is there, those systems would persist. And what I realized pretty quickly is that when a new principal comes in, they often bring in new systems. Regardless of whether the old systems were working or not, they just have their systems that they know and uh, that worked at the previous place they were at. Um, and that can be challenging because, you know, you can create, you could spend three, four years building something at a school. Uh, there might be remnants of that that persist or that um, keep happening, but when a new principal comes in, they tend to bring in new new systems and new people, and it can be challenging to do that. Turnover is a really big, hard thing when it comes to restorative justice. Uh, staff churn, really hard, because this takes a lot of training and a lot of support, and when you bring in new systems and new staff, you you don't have to start from scratch, but you do, there is a lot of, you know, taking a few steps back to begin again. And again, you just have to be persistent, have to be patient, keep your eye on the prize and move towards where you want to be. Um, but to understand that, um, that um, it is important to build those systems, but that the system might be uh, changed when a new principal comes in, something I've learned. Um, another one is to connect community. I think that Restorative justice, by definition, means connecting with community. And what I mean in particular when you're in a school uh, or in a school system means work with community-based organizations um, that are doing this work or that can help you, that want to help you. Um, in Oakland, we work with an organization called Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. Um, we work with, luckily, we have, we have a lot of restorative justice organizations in the Bay Area that we partner with. Uh, and we work with and we support and they support us and they come out when we need them and we come out when they need us. Um, and it feels good to connect a community in that way. You know, schools, schools do not exist in a vacuum. Um, they are part of a community, they're part of an ecosystem. And um, it's, it can be really hard having been in a nonprofit before coming to the district. I know it is really hard to sort of break into a school into a school or into a school system, even if you have good intentions and you want to do it for free for them. It's really hard to do that because schools, there's no time, they have their own thing going. Um, so it's really, in, it's really important that um, we in education are able to connect with our community, community groups that are doing this work and it will ultimately be, be beneficial to everyone. Um, the next one is something that hopefully you'll come out of this workshop really understanding because I've been harping on it nonstop, which is that being relentless, like waves on the shore, nonstop around building and maintaining community. That is the proactive work that needs to be done. That is the muscle that needs to be flexed. Um, if you think about it, when there's a conflict or there's a harm that needs to be dealt with, that's not, you don't want that to be the first time these folks have ever been in a circle. Um, you want them to understand the process they're going to be getting into. And you want them to um, be comfortable with it, comfortable enough to be able to, um, to be able to participate and know what the possibilities are. Okay, well, hopefully that makes sense to all of you, but um, it's really important to be relentless in terms of that. Um, beware RJ Light. What I would call RJ Light is if you're just focusing on conflict and harm, which is the tendency um, because there's a need in the school and that need is to deal with all the conflict that students are in and even adults but one conflict after another one student being sent out of class after another these students got no fight non-stop firefighting all day long if restorative justice becomes that's the only thing that you're doing in other words you're just doing tier two 
then it is going to be seen as another punitive response. It's just going to be part of the system. You know, you're, you did something wrong, go to the RJ person. You did something wrong, go to Restore of Justice. And um, you're going to be not, you're going to be um, missing what Restore of Justice is, which is really about a way of being together, right? I keep saying that. It's a way of being together in community, which includes conflict resolution. But most of it is really about just being with each other and building that community. And so if you're just focusing on Tier 2, um, your, um, your restorative justice implementation will ultimately not work because it'll just be seen by the students and the other teachers as, um, as uh, just, you know, uh, a behavioral intervention. And it's not just that. And lastly, when we're talking about conflict, um, conflict is normal, conflict is natural. There will never be a time when there isn't conflict. Um, we need to embrace it. We understand. We need to understand that conflict is an opportunity for resolution and closer connection between individuals and clarification and clearing things up. Um, there will always be conflict, so we need to tend it before it turns into a huge fire. Um, so we need to be fire tenders, fire keepers, not firefighters, when it comes to conflict. Um, we actually want to encourage productive conflict in our teams. Um, we want to address those conflicts and work through them together because on the other side of that conflict is opportunity, is resolution, is getting better. Um, and one thing I've seen happen in uh, schools, communities in particular, is that that doesn't happen. Conflict gets unaddressed amongst the adults and before you know it, you're in a high conflict situation where people have formed into camps. They have created a binary of us versus them. And um, they start to define themselves by who they're against. And once you've gotten there, it's going to take a long time to walk it back down to being in com a productive community. Once you've, once you've embraced that narrative, it's going to be harder to embrace the other narratives that are also in place that are positive, that you're not focusing on. And it's going to take time and effort to do that. And so we want to avoid that. But I can, I can tell you, working in, in this district, and I suspect other districts, it's the same way as that the adults, um, that we, we tend not to tend our conflicts. And then before you know it, we've, um, we've separated into this us versus them mentality. And we, that really does not serve the children. You know, we want to um, create an environment where kids can learn first and foremost, and they can attend and achieve and graduate. Um, and that's not going to happen if, if we got if we're too messy as adults, um, because we're not dealing with our conflict because we just don't want to. Nobody wants to deal with conflict. It's not fun, but you you know, we have to be adults and, and deal with it and have those conversations. And restorative justice is one good way to do that. Um, let's see. Are there any um, questions or things coming up for people as we, um, as I finish talking about that? Because we're, we're starting to wrap up on the day. Anything from my insights there? Anything coming up for anyone? Any questions? Actually, now would be a good time to move to my Q&A slide, and I have to show it to you because I really like it. So let me just let me just show it to you. There we go. So now it's time for Q&A. Okay. And those of you who don't know who that is, that's Oakland's own Steph Curry with his daughter. So I would love to hear some some questions uh, or, or even challenges if people just like. I don't know about this, you know, go ahead and, and, and lift it up. Um, what's coming up for you? Dave, I also wanted to say that we do this with our staff too. So I've done this with my staff, the IU. Um, I did it with new teachers. Like, so we would have like a new teacher orientation when I was at the district and like, it's a good way to build community and really set the the stage. And so I'm not going to call out any of my my people that I see, David Covington. But um, we did 
um, do this uh, with our staff a couple of times. Um, and so I think like if anyone's thinking about like, how's this going to work? How am I going to get my teachers to do it? Like get them in a circle, make a centerpiece and keep it moving. Like it really isn't like that. It, it is heavy work to do, but it can, you, it could be light and fun too. So I've done this with adults probably more than my direct experience with kids and they end up liking it. Yeah, because they feel connected to each other. Thank you. So let's, why don't I, um, I just put something in the chat here. What's one thing you're taking away from today? Please feel free to write in the chat because we're wrapping up. What is one thing that you are taking away from today's workshop? Thank you, Heather. Yes. This is backed by research. In fact, WestEd just came out with a study like a few, like within the last week that shows that restorative justice can impact racial disparities and discipline. Um, you can Google that and find it. The importance of RJ being a mindset, not a program. Yes. Suspensions have gone down 50%. Yeah. <laughs> Trauma informed. Yes. Thank you. What's one thing you're taking away from today? Keep pushing. Yes, hearts and minds. Right on. Um, as you enter into the chat, the things that you're taking away from today, I want to um, read a quote, a closing quote, and then show you some, some resources. So let's do that before we end uh, for today. Um, okay, so the quote, that I really love is, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Honey, I gotta do this. Yes. Don't do this. Okay. <laughs> don't you just love Zoom? All right, so um, now I wanna show you some resources. And um, I'm going to put some of these resources. These are some resources I can think of. There, there's When I first started doing restorative justice, there's literally barely anything on the internet about restorative justice. Um, I will really encourage you to go to our website, which you can see right there, www.ousd.org slash restorative justice, um, because I have put a ton of, of information on there. Um, that you can um, learn from. Also, there's our whole school information uh, implementation guide, which I'm going to put the link here, which is also on our website. Um, we have a peer RJ implementation guide, um, which I'm also going to put here for how to implement peer restorative justice. Um, there's some great books out there. This first one here, The Little Book of Race and Restorative Justice by Fania Davis, um, who happens to be Angela Davis's sister, but is also um, a friend of mine and lives here in Oakland and helped start RJ in Oakland schools. Um, sh this book is amazing. It's short. It's in, it's incredibly readable, and it really helps you understand the connection between racial justice and restorative justice. Um, Circle Forward by Kay Pranis and Carolyn Boyce Watson is a great um, book of circle templates. Um, there's another book edited by Edward Belandra called Colorizing Restorative Justice that I would um um, also recommend. And then perhaps the first book written about restorative justice in the United States was by Howard Zare called Changing Lenses. Um, he is a Mennonite and he's from Eastern Mennonite University. Uh, now there's the Howard Zare Center at Eastern Mennonite University are about restorative justice. Um, so he wrote Changing Lenses. If you don't want to read that um, book, you can read the little book of restorative justice, which is a much smaller version. Um, which is also a great book. The first little book, the first book in the little book series. There's a tons of books in the little book series, and then here is um, this is uh, an article that I wrote that you might find interesting in the Mindful Schools um, org. Uh, just kind of a firsthand experience talking about restorative justice, um, and those are some those are some resources. Like I said, there's just there's a lot out there about restorative justice, and um, a lot you can um, you can check out. So um, it is. Let's, it's Thanks. almost time to end. So 
Jess, should I pass it back to you? Yeah, I just want to um, close up. First of all, I want to say thank you so much for this wonderful presentation over the last two hours. I, I'm sure everybody took a lot away from it. And I want to especially thank Lisha too for providing the Pennsylvania perspective. That was very enlightening as well. Um, we will be posting this once it is captioned on the Schoology page for access for you and your teams in the future, this presentation. And we will also take all of those resources and put them there as well for your access at a later time should you need them.